Hello everybody and welcome to this offering for British Science Week uh, coming live to you from the University of Lincoln. My name is Dr Kay Ritchie and I'm a senior lecturer in cognitive psychology at the University of Lincoln. Um, so I work predominantly um, teaching our students and doing a lot of research on face perception. So I'm going to tell you today about some of the research that we do in the face lab in the School of Psychology at the University of Lincoln. So I can see that a few people are watching. If you would like to tell me where you're tuning in from, you can type that in the comments next to the um, YouTube video and I can see where you're tuning in from. And likewise, if you have any questions or anything as we go along, if you want to type them in the questions as we go along, that's fine. If you'd rather save them for the end, that's fine too. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the science behind photo ID. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first thing to say about photo ID is that this isn't just um, sort of a cognitive psychology problem. It's not just something that we dream up in the lab and test in the lab. It does really have real world consequences. So if you think about um, your photo ID and where you use it, you might use it at border control. You might use your photo ID um, to prove that you are who you say you are when you're picking up a parcel from the post office or for entry into different places of work, that sort of thing. Now, it seems really intuitive to us that we would use our faces as a form of identification, that we're happy using a picture of our face to prove that we are who we say we are. Now, that's um, a really important issue because when we're thinking about photo ID, um, we can think about lots of different pictures of the same person um, that look in different ways. So we've got three pictures here. The middle picture is a genuine UK driving license picture. And the question is, does it belong to the person on the left or on the right? Now, you can imagine that's a driving license picture. It could be a passport photo or it could be any other form of photo ID. Well, the answer is um, all those three photos actually show the same person. So what we're seeing there is that the same person can look very different in very different um, images. Now, that's important when we're thinking about photo ID, because as we think about photo ID, we think about the person whose job it is to check our ID. Now, not everyone who looks at your photo ID will immediately be able to see that that's you. So we like to rely on photo ID because we think, yep, I can easily see that that person look in that photograph looks exactly like me. I know that that's me. My face can look that way. But actually, when we're unfamiliar with someone, um, it's really difficult to see that uh, the same person who's standing in front of you holding the ID photo is the person who is in the picture. So what we want to do when we're testing um, photo ID and looking at its utility is that we want to say, well, lots of different people can look really different in lots of different um, pictures. And so when we're thinking of photo ID, we don't necessarily know when we're looking at someone if that's actually them in their in their photo ID. So the problem there is that our familiarity with people. So when we're familiar with someone, it's easy for us to see that um, different photos of them actually show the same person. But the problem is the person who's checking your photo won't necessarily be able to see that that is you. So that's the issue that we have here with this um, driving license picture and these two other pictures of this woman. She looks very different in the different pictures. If you know her, that's really easy to cope with, but if you don't know her, then that's much more of a problem. And the person checking your photo ID is always gonna be, almost always going to be unfamiliar with you. So that's what we're interested in studying. Just um, how different people look different in different photographs and how unfamiliar face perception is different to familiar face perception. So we have standardized tasks that we use in the lab for these sorts of um, tests. So here's one, it's called the Glasgow face matching test. And these are two items from it. So the two pictures on the left, these would be presented side by side on a computer screen. And this is our approximation of what, um, a uh, sort of photo ID checking task would be in the lab. So we've got these two photos side by side on the screen. And the question is, are those two photos of the same person or are they two different people? So the two photos on the left there, those actually show two different men. And the photos on the right are two photos of the same woman. And they're taken only seconds apart, but using different cameras. So you can see how just by changing the camera, the angle ever so slightly, you get two quite different looking photos of the same person, even though they're taken within seconds of each other. 
So that's a kind of illustration of how um, face matching, we call this a face matching test. So unfamiliar face matching is actually really quite difficult. This would be easy if you knew the person, but because you don't know them, it's more difficult. So um, typical performance on this test is about 80% accurate. So people are right about 80% of the time. Now chance there would be 50%, right? Because people either say they're the same person or they're two different people. So 50% being chance, 80% maybe sounds quite good. But actually, if you think about places like um, Heathrow in the olden days when we were allowed to travel, the number of people coming through Heathrow on a daily basis, if um, passport controllers are making 20% errors, right, if they're only getting 80% right, then that's a little bit of a problem uh, when we think about face perception. So what we're really interested in is why is unfamiliar face perception so difficult? How does a face go from being unfamiliar to familiar? And how can we improve unfamiliar face perception? So why is unfamiliar face recognition so hard? That's one of the key questions that we study in the face lab here at the University of Lincoln. Well, there are two competing and kind of um, interlinked problems. And those are the problems of variability and the problems of familiarity. So when you're familiar with someone, you're really good at seeing that lots of different photos show that same person. So if you're familiar with Tom Cruise, you'll be able to see that all the pictures on the left hand side there show Tom Cruise. And if you're unfamiliar with my friend Adam, then you won't, it might be a little bit more difficult to see that all the images on the right hand side show the same person. And it's kind of a qualitatively different experience. When you're looking at all those photos of Tom Cruise, there's no problem. You just say, yeah, those look like Tom Cruise. I can't really articulate what it is that's common between those pictures. They just all show Tom Cruise. Whereas if you're looking at the pictures on the other side of the screen of the unfamiliar chap, you might have to inspect those images a little more closely in order to be able to tell that yes, those definitely show the same person. So the problem there is familiarity. We're good at uh, noticing that it's the same person in different photos when we're familiar with them and poorer at it when we're unfamiliar with them. But the other problem is variability. The same person can look very different in different pictures. So once you're familiar with that person's variability, you're familiar with their face, right? So when you're familiar with someone, you've known them for a while, you've seen their face look lots of different ways. Um, whereas when you're not familiar with them, all you've got to go on is the way they're looking right now and that picture that's in their photo ID. Um, so one of the, the reasons why we might um, be so bad at unfamiliar face perceptions because we've not learned all the different ways that this person varies and so some of my work has been focused on understanding how we learn what new people look like and so um, in this particular study what we were interested in seeing was okay we say unfamiliar face perception um, is problematic because we can't cope with the variability of the same person between different pictures so what if we have to experience enough of their variability in order to learn them so to test that what we did was we gathered images from the internet of the same people. So this is these are all four photos of the same person, and he's chosen to be unfamiliar in the UK. This is um, an Australian pop star who we're not familiar with here. So we can go on the internet and get lots of different pictures of him um, that we're allowed to use for research purposes. And so there we've got a high variability set of images. So what I mean there is he changes in um, age, his hairstyle, Bit of changes in head angle, facial expression, um, he's maybe getting a bit older, he's a bit thinner in some photos than others. It's also a different camera, different lighting across all of those different images. And then what we can do is for the same people, um, we can download uh, lots of very similar looking images and we call these the low variability images. So here what we've got are lots of different stills of the same video of the guy talking into the camera. So it's the same person, but uh, now the variability is restricted. So he can still move his head, he can change his head angle, he can change his facial expression, but he can't age or change his hairstyle, the lighting doesn't change, the camera's the same, etc. So now what we've got is a much more restricted variability. So we call these the low variability images. And the question is what happens if we ask you to learn someone either from their high variability images or from their low variability images. And this is exactly what we did um, in our study. So we showed uh, participants lots of different people and we showed those people with a name. So you, if you were a participant in our study, you'd get a name at the top of the screen and then you'd see 10 images of someone and you're just asked, learn that this person has this name. And then for the next person, you'd get the same thing, their name and 10 photos of them. And you half of the people you learn from their high variability photos 
and half of them you learn from your low variability photos. Um, and so the question is, who have you learned better? Are you, have you learned the people from the high variability images better than the people from the low variability images? Well, that is um, exactly what we find. So when we show you people in high variability, you learn them better. So I'll just explain this uh, graph here. So the light bars correspond to the people who you've learned in high variability, and the dark bars correspond to the people you've learned in low variability. Now, up the left-hand side, we've got percent correct. And so those first two bars on the left there show the percent correct um, of people's responses. Now, the test was just a new image of that person. Is this person the, the same person as this name? So you get a name and a face, new images. Is this the same person as this name? And so if we look at those left-hand side bars there, the light bar, high variability, people are more accurate than they were with the, le the uh, dark bar, low variability. So people have learned the people better when they learn them from their high variability photos compared to their low variability photos. And on the right hand side, the right hand side of the graph shows their reaction time in seconds and um, there's no difference in their reaction time. So it's not like they're just getting quicker with the high variability people. That's not it. They're getting more accurate with the high variability people um, with no difference in their reaction time. So what we're arguing there is that we, we know that we're poor at um, recognizing the same person across different photos when they're unfamiliar to us, but we're good at it when they're familiar to us. So is that exposure to variability important in the acquisition of a new identity? So is that important for learning? And what we've shown here is yes, it is. Once you've seen lots of different, very different looking photos of someone, you're going to be better at recognizing them from a new image than if you've seen uh, less of their variability. So that kind of explains why we're poor at this face matching tests with um, unfamiliar people, because all we've got to go on is those two photos that we're seeing. Whereas with familiar people, we're better because we know all the different ways their face can vary. So you can train people, people learn faces better once they've been exposed to that person's variability. So is there something that we can do then based on those findings from face learning that exposure to variability is good? Is there something that we can learn from that and take that on to this face matching test? Um, so that's our approximation of the, the photo ID, these two images on the screen, is it the same person, yes or no? Can we learn something from the learning literature and apply that to um, unfamiliar face recognition in general and unfamiliar face matching? So if we want to, We've said people are poor at unfamiliar face recognition. How can we improve that? We could change the types of images that we're showing people. So the suggestion here would be to change the images that appear on our passports in order to make photo ID checking easier um, for the passport checker. So one idea is this appeal to variability. So on the left hand side there, you've got just two images side by side, and that's what we would normally show you in a face matching test, and that's what you'd normally get on a passport. One image on the passport, one person standing in front of you. Um, and so we call this the one-to-one -one test. So do these two photos show the same person, yes or no? Well, we learned from the face learning um, studies that people are better when they've been exposed to some variability. So what if instead of these two images on the screen, we did what's on the right there. We have four images and we say, well, these all show the same person. Here's another image. Is this him too? So the idea here would be your passport would now include four images of you. And uh, that would be compared to you standing in front of the passport controller. So does this exposure to variability help in face matching? Well, what we do when we look at um, face matching data is we split it up into match trials where the two photos do show the same person and mismatch trials where they don't show the same person. So here this would be a match trial would be in the two image condition, they both show different people and the four image condition, um, a mismatch trial would be the four images all show one person, but the target is a different person. So we've got match trials when it shows the same person a mismatch trials when it shows two different people. What we've got down the side of this graph is percent correct. So the blue bars here are for one image and the pink bars are for four images. And so what we know um, here is that when we provide four images, people get better at saying, yes, it's a match, right? So their performance has gone up in the pink bars on the left-hand side compared to the uh, blue bars. So showing four pictures of the same person uh, makes you makes it easier for you to say yes this is the same person but we also get this sort of um, accompanying uh, fall in performance for mismatch trials so when you've got four photos of someone 
and it's not them, you're still more likely to say, yes, it's them. So you get the mismatch trials wrong. So what we see is that instead of improving performance, providing four images in this matching test actually makes you say yes more. It's like you say, gosh, he looks like that, 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 and that. Okay, well, this is him as well. So you say yes a lot, so you get the match trials right, but you say yes a lot, so you get the mismatch trials wrong. So it doesn't seem like um, actually providing multiple images on photo ID would be a very good idea. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, that's all well and good. These are computer tasks. What happens in the real world? Passport control is a real world task, right? So it's okay, we've, we've tested that too. And um, so what we did was uh, a study with our students. And what we did was we asked our students to go out into the world um, armed with either a photo of them, a photo of someone who looks a bit like them, that would be the mismatch trial, or four photos of them, or four photos of someone who looks a bit like them. And what we found was that actually, increasing the number of images didn't help at all. So these pink bars, the four image bars, are not significantly higher than the blue bars. So providing four images didn't make you better at saying yes when it is a match, and it didn't make it you better at saying no when it is a mismatch. So actually it looks like providing multiple images on photo ID is probably not the way to go to improve performance. But there's other ideas of what we might be able to do with the images to improve unfamiliar face performance. So another idea would be to um, use face averages. So by face averages, what we mean is uh, taking multiple images of the same person and averaging them together. So you can see on that left side image there, what we've got is lots of blue dots that are kind of marking out the important points of the face, where the eyes are, where all the different parts of the nose are, where the mouth is, where the chin is, etc. And so we put those, we call them landmarks, we put those landmarks on lots of different images of the same person's face and then we can average them together. So what we get is an image that looks like uh, the image on the right hand side there, where we've smoothed out all the differences between the images of the same person. So the average is smiling, which means that most of our images of this person were smiling. But what we get rid of is sort of changes in head angle, changes in lighting, any changes that are not specific to the person, but that are specific to the photo. And what we get left with is everything that's just person specific, not specific to any one photo. And so that should give us a better idea of what that person looks like, a better representation of that person. So some people have argued maybe we should be putting face averages on passports since they should be in theory better than any one individual image. Um, we could put a face average on a passport and maybe that would help face matching performance. So we've tested that too. We tested that in our live tasks. So our students went out either with an image of them or an average of them or an image or an average of someone else. And what we found was again, just nothing going on. So um, in fact, numerically people were a little bit better with the single images rather than the average images. So. It looks like, uh, so that again, that's percent correct down the side. Our match trials is when it shows the same person, mismatch when it shows two different people. And the single image bars, the blue bars and the average image bars, the pink bars are actually no different statistically from each other. So people are no better at unfamiliar face matching when we provide them with um, a face average. So that all sounds a bit, a bit of a shame. You know, we've tried a lot of different things as to how we might improve unfamiliar face uh, matching performance. So it looks like actually changing the images that we use isn't going to help. So what about instead of thinking about changing the images that we put on passports, can we change the people? Can we train the observers? If we train people um, to do this task, will they be better? And would that improve unfamiliar face recognition? And this is something that's been tried um, quite a few times across the world. And what I'm going to focus on is some work from um, a lab that we work quite closely with um, at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, in Australia. Um, and they have looked at lots of different training courses and what happens when people take part in training courses. So um, this is a graph from uh, one of their most, most recent papers. Um, and I'll take you through it. So down the side, we've got accuracy. And basically, we've got three different tests. They're labeled GFMT, that's the Glasgow face matching test that I told you about before, GBU unlimited and GBU four seconds. So there's three different tests. Don't worry too much about those. The, then each of these pairs of bars are labeled course A and course B, and then a control group. So course A is one 
professional training course to train um, forensic facial examiners in uh, the task that they're doing. So forensic facial examiners are people whose job it is to look at images. So it might be a previous arrest image and a CCTV image of someone committing a crime, or it might be um, you know, an image of someone applying for a passport, comparing that to images on a watch list of people who are not allowed to be given passports. And what they do is they painstakingly kind of compare uh, the different features of the face in the images. And that process can take some time. And so they go on training courses to be trained how to do this. And so what we've got is course A and course B, which are two different training courses. And then the bars labeled control are just people who have not done any training courses. So the light bars are the people's performance before the training and the dark bars are their performance after the training. And I hope you can see just by looking at that overall that there's basically no differences. So going on a training course to be trained to become better at unfamiliar face matching actually it may have no bearing on your face matching ability at all. So when we do see improvements, we see tiny improvements and they're not consistent across different courses that claim to be able to train you in doing these tasks. So it looks like we maybe can't train people by these specific um, sort of feature by feature training courses to get better at, at face recognition. So what about experience? What about if people just do it over and over again? Well, here's um, another, another paper by the same uh, lab in, at the University of New South Wales. And what they did was they tested passport officers and they tested students. And they looked at different measures of um, unfamiliar face matching, face recognition ability. And so here's some more graphs. What we're seeing here is the top graphs are showing you their accuracy in terms of percent correct and the bottom graphs are showing reaction time. The dark bars are passport officers and the light bars are students. And what you're getting is sort of two different tests, which are target versus two year photo and target versus official ID. So that's why the bars are clumped together. But essentially, if you look at the top bars for match trials and mismatch trials, only in one test are passport officers um, outperforming students. So these are people who do this task every day and they're outperforming um, the students only in sort of one part of one task. But, and if we look uh, underneath at the, the graphs labeled C, um, those are the reaction time graphs. And what we're seeing is that the passport officers are taking a lot longer to come to a decision. But actually the decision they're coming to is, is not likely to be much more accurate, if at all, than the decision that students will come to. So that shows you that people whose job it is to do this type of task actually aren't any better than untrained students. The other interesting thing that they found in this um, study was that there was no relationship between uh, the passport officer's performance on the test. So that's down the side there, we're getting um, uh, accuracy on the face matching test. And along the side here, we've got their employment duration in years. And what you can see is that there's no, there's no relationship, there's no correlation between these two variables. So if it was that the longer you've been doing this, the better you get, the dots would all be clustered on a straight line going up the diagonal like that. But they're actually just all over the place. And what we can see is some people have been doing the job for under a year and are quite good. Some people have been doing the job for over 20 years and are performing really quite poorly on this test. So there seems to be no relationship between actually doing this as your job and being um, sort of any better than untrained students. And the most interesting thing, I guess, is that it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it for, that doesn't um, correlate with your ability to do the task. So if people are poor at the task, they can't be trained and doing it for years and years and years doesn't make them any better. What can we do to improve unfamiliar face matching? Well, one thing we can do is what we can see from this graph is that some people are just good at this. Some people are just better than others at this type of task. So that's quite interesting. And what we say is that um, face recognition ability lies on sort of a spectrum. So there's some people who are really, really excellent. You might hear them sometimes referred to as super recognizers. Um, in fact, the Metropolitan Police have um, employed super recognizers to try and spot criminals in CCTV um, and things like that. So these are people who perform extremely well. They never forget a face. Uh, they describe it being a little bit awkward because they might recognize someone who was briefly in their primary school class. And 20 years later, they'll see them in a supermarket and go up to them and talk to them as if they know them. And the other person thinks, that's a bit scary. Who are you? How do you recognize me? So these people are just really very, very good at recognizing faces. Most of us then lie somewhere in the middle. 
And then there's another group of people right down at the bottom who are very bad at recognizing faces, even faces that are familiar to them. Uh, and those people are, are described as having something called prosopagnosia, which just means sort of face blindness. So they, uh, that's usually as a result of um, some sort of form of brain damage or sometimes people are, people are born with this condition where they can't recognize faces. But that's quite uncommon, as is being a super recognizer. Which, what's much more common is that most of us lie in the middle of this spectrum of ability. But what you can see from this graph of uh, the passport officer's ability on the face recognition task is that some of them just do really well, uh, irrespective of how long they've been doing the job, so irrespective of how much experience they have. So what we could do is we could use that knowledge that some people are just going to be good at this test, and we could use that while we are recruiting people, right? So instead of just saying, well, we'll recruit anyone and train them to be quite good at the test, uh, what we'd rather do is say, well, at the recruiting stage, we'll administer a face matching test. And if people are good at it, those are the people who will then go on um, further in the recruitment process. And that's actually what's being, do being done already in Sydney with the, this group uh, who've done this work at the University of New South Wales. They're working with the Australian Passport Authority and they actually do now screen applicants for passport uh, roles uh, and they screen them for their face recognition ability at the point of recruiting them. So we know we can't train people, we can't change uh, the, the types of images on photo ID. So what should we be doing? Well, we should just be picking the people who are already quite good at this sort of test. And that's exactly um, what they're doing in Australia now. Okay, there's one other thing that's very curious that does seem to um, sort of have a training effect on people's ability to do uh, face recognition tests. And so this is something that we, again, we've done with our students um, based on an old paper uh, by Andrew Dowsett and Mike Burton. So what we do here is we get people to do a face matching test in pairs. So I'll explain this little figure to you. At slide one, at uh, time one, when they're, when they're doing the task on their own, so there's three parts of the task, four parts of the task. So they do part one on their own. They're sitting in the lab back to back, uh, not speaking to each other. Then time two, they're asked to do the next block of face matching trials together. So they're asked to both come to the same computer, look at each uh, pair of faces and make a decision. Is it the same person or is it two different people? Make that decision together, discuss their decision and come to a joint decision. And then at time three, they sit back to back and ignore each other, don't talk to each other and do uh, the third part of the test again. And then a week later, what we did was we emailed people um, a week later and asked them to take part in the task again. So now we've got a sort of week delay condition. And so we're interested in seeing what happens when you perform the test in pairs. Well, actually, something really, really interesting happens. So by doing the task in pairs, everyone gets better than they were when they did it alone. But what's really interesting is when we look at the high performers compared to the low performers. So in each pair, there's just going to be one person who does a little bit better at the task than the other person. So we call the person who's done better the high performer and the person who's done poorer, we call them the low performer. And what we do is we split up their data and we look at that differently. And it's really interesting what we find. So what we see is that, um, so again, down the side here, we've got percent correct. Um, and we have our high performers, and then the gray bars are time one, pink bars are time two when they do it in a pair, uh, light blue bars are time three, um, so doing it on their own again immediately after the pair, and dark blue bars are time four, so doing it on their own again, but at least a week after they, they did it in the lab. And what we see is that these high performers get better when they're working with someone else. So they get a little bit better by doing it with someone else. But overall, their performance is pretty, they're steady eddies. They're doing pretty well on this task all the way through. The really interesting thing comes when we look at the low performers. So they start off in time one being really quite poor, a lot poorer than the high performers were at time one. So the high performers here were up around 80 percent and these low performers are lower than 70 percent. So they're, they're doing quite a bit worse on the task. Doing it with the other person boosts their performance and they get really, really good. But the interesting thing is they stay good. So they, when they go back to doing the task on their own immediately after the pairs session, they're still good at it. And even over a week later, they're still really good at doing this task. And in fact, by time three and time four, there's no difference between the high and the low performers. 
So that's really interesting. Something's going on when we do this kind of task with someone else, we're discussing our answer. If you're the lower performer, now bear in mind the high and low performers don't know which one's a high and low performer. We just ascertain that afterwards by looking at their data. Somehow the low performers are learning how to do this task just by speaking it through with the high performers. So they're learning something about how to do the task and that's actually increasing their performance on it. And not only do they get better when they're doing it with someone else, they stay better when they do it again immediately afterwards on their own, and then they stay better when they do it a week later on their own. So there's something happening when you do this sort of task with another person, you're just getting better at it. You're learning somehow from the other person how to do this task. So we think that's really interesting. What we don't know is why this works. We've tested a lot of different things that could be um, sort of an explanation for the effect. None of the things we've dreamt up and tested actually explain the effect. So if you do have an idea of what might be driving this pairs effect, please feel free to get in touch and let us know. We'd be really keen to hear any ideas that anyone has. But that looks to be a seemingly sort of foolproof um, way of training people. If we can't put people on a, a professional training course to make them better at the task, what we can certainly do is um, pair them up with someone else and they should then get better, particularly if they were a poorer performer to start off with. Okay, so that's a bit about um, sort of general performance with regular photos of people in terms of photo ID and unfamiliar face recognition. But there is a new problem uh, for photo ID and that is face morphs. So a face morph is a, a sort of blend of two images of two different people. So the idea might be um, if, if I'm a criminal and I'm on a watch list and I'm not allowed to apply for a passport, I could get a photograph of me and a photograph of my friend who looks a bit like me, morph them together. So we've now got a photograph that looks enough like my friend so that she can then apply for a new passport in her name and that this blended image, this morph of the two of us, looks enough like her for her to be issued a new passport in her name. But the image also looks enough like me for me to then take her passport from her and use it when I'm crossing borders. So this is a real problem. This is something that real criminals are really doing. And so it is a real world uh, problem for border control, for photo ID and for face recognition. Um, so what do these face morphs look like? Well, I think they look terrifyingly convincing, to be perfectly honest. So what we've got is on the left, a photo of person A, on the right, a photo of person B, and then we use the same software that uh, when I spoke about making face averages, we can use a similar software and we just blend the two faces together and we get a face morph that looks a bit like person A and a bit like person B. So the idea is she could now, person A could now apply for a new passport using this morphed photo. It looks enough like her that she would be issued with the passport. Now she can give the passport to person B and it looks enough like her that she could use it to get through borders. And that is a real problem that's really happening. So what we want to know is, well, are people any good at spotting these? Can we train people to get good at spotting morphs? Um, what happens when you're being asked to, to look at uh, new passport applications? Are you even able to spot that some of them might be face morphs? So we tested this in an experiment um, reasonably recently. And what we had was over time, you just saw a stream of images, uh, one image at a time on the screen, and you're asked, is this a morph, yes or no? Is this a morph? Yes or no? Or we can ask you on a scale of sort of definitely not a morph to definitely a morph to rate um, sort of how morphy you think these pictures look. So I'll let you have a look at those just for a few seconds and see if you can spot if there are any face morphs there. So if you were doing the test, you would just see them one at a time. Is this a morph or not? Is this a morph or not? Um, well, these are the morphs. So there were actually four face morphs there. The others are just... Uh, images of people, but each of these ones that's labelled a morph is in fact two images of two different people morphed together to make a new photo. So those images labelled morph are not actually people who exist. They are a blend of two different people, so they're not real people. But I think, I hope you'll agree with me, that they look pretty convincing, they're pretty hard to spot. So what we were interested in is how good are people at spotting these images? And what we found was that people were 51% accurate. Now, chance is 50%. Is that a morph or not? 
If you're only 51% accurate, you're no better than chance. So essentially people are guessing. People can't spot these face morphs. Um, and we also tried a sort of training session. So we tried to give some people some training, uh, telling them, giving them feedback on what was a morph and what wasn't a morph. Um, so we had one group who did morph training. So these are the bars on the left. And we had another control group who didn't do any training. Uh, don't worry about this. This is another, D prime is another measure of uh, people's accuracy, basically. So what we can see is that people's accuracy is hovering around zero, not very good. And even when they've done training, so the dark bars are after training, the light bars are before training. So even once they've done some training, they get no better than they were before. Um, and obviously the control people didn't do training and they don't improve. Uh, what we did find here was that the people who happened to be in our control group were a little bit better at the task than the people who happened to be in our training group. But that's not really what we're interested in. What we're interested in is can you be trained to spot these face morphs? And the answer is no. The grey after training bars are uh, no higher. So people are no more accurate than the white before training bars. So face morphs look like they might be the new persistent problem for at least for human face recognition. Um, we've some reason to believe that some algorithms that are trained on detecting face morphs might be a little bit better than others and might be a little bit better than humans, but it all depends on the set of images that they're trained on. So if they're trained on very sort of obvious, easy to spot morphs, they might not be so good at um, detecting these high quality morphs that humans have trouble detecting. So face morphs, a new problem for photo ID. So that's about um, sort of wrapping things up. So photo ID, what have we learned today? Well, variability between photos of the same person is pretty problematic. We can learn faces from variability, and that involves some sort of memory, but variability or averages don't actually help in face matching. Now that might be because those tasks don't involve any memory, but that's a story for another time. So people can't be trained. We looked at professional training courses. We looked at uh, how long people had been doing a face matching job. And uh, it looks like people can't be trained um, at, to get better at uh, face matching, at unfamiliar face perception. But it looks like performing the task in a pair might actually help. We're not sure why. So that's an area for future research. And of course, face morphs that, that pose a new problem for photo ID. And that's something else that we're keen to keep uh, looking at in terms of our research uh, here at the University of Lincoln in the Face Lab in the School of Psychology. So I hope that's been relatively interesting. Thank you very much for listening. And I will just pause for a wee minute to see if anyone has any questions. And uh, if you think of a question later, please do feel free to get in touch um, via the university's pages or Twitter, etc. So I'll just leave a couple of seconds to see if anyone has any questions. And if not, we'll say goodbye. OK, I'm not seeing any questions coming through, so thanks very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed uh, listening to today's session and do stay tuned for more sessions from the University of Lincoln for British Science Week. Thanks very much.